Well, good morning. My name is Matt Stone. I'm one of the pastors here. Honored to be in worship with you today. As we continue the series, A Thrill of Hope, which we started last week, uh, it's really just two weeks as we think about as individuals and as a community, as we, uh, how we're going to approach the year. Uh, we're hoping to approach the year in a way that's defined by the hope of the gospel. Uh, as I was uh, looking at various things this week, as I'm sure things have scrolled across your screen or news feed in one way or another, um, looked at some of the things that Dr. Martin Luther King had to say as we prepared to remember and celebrate his life and his ministry. And uh, this made me think about what we've been talking about this week and last week. Uh, Dr. King said, we must accept the finite disappointment, but we must never lose infinite hope. And I love that. What a beautiful line. We talked last week about N.T. Wright's um, uh, phrase, uh, uh, a hope-shaped mission. And I love that turn of phrase, and I love the concept behind it, that our hope as followers of Jesus is grounded not just in what happens after life, although that's part of it, and our hope, in, uh, our hope as, as followers of Jesus is not grounded in anything that happens in another world. Rather, our hope as followers of Jesus is grounded in this life and in this world, because ultimately the resurrection of Jesus signals to us, bears testimony to us that the kingdom of God has come to this earth. So we don't have to wait until after we die to live hope. We don't have to wait until we're transported into another realm or another dimension to know what hope is like. That's something that we can know and experience in this life. So that's, why we th that's, that's what makes me think about a thrill of hope. It is a thrilling life to know that I don't have to wait till I die to experience life with God. That's something that happens here and now. That's something that shapes everything that we do. It shapes how we see the world around us. It shapes how we engage in relationships, both with Christians and those who aren't yet Christians. It shapes the decisions that we make. It shapes how we spend the resources God has given us. That hope shapes everything. And it is thrilling to know that the ways that we participate in God's kingdom today are, are themselves a participation in the eternal. Right? So when we think about meaning and uh, fulfillment, when we think about purpose in life, I can't imagine a more thrilling meaning or purpose or fulfillment than participating in the kingdom of God while I'm still alive in this life. Right? And so that's what we talked about last week. Our first job then is to be connected intimately to the hope of the gospel, if it animates everything that we do, if it gives shape to every decision we make and every conversation that we have, then our first job is to be connected to the hope of the gospel. However, our second job is inextricably linked. We can't, we can't do one without the other. Our second job then is to connect our neighbors with that hope of the gospel. Now, that's our second job. If our first job is to be uh, connected to that hope ourselves, our second job is to help others become connected to it. And I think it's a powerful notion in this day and age because I think there is a hope deficit in our world. And the truth is, you don't need me to elaborate on that point. You know experientially by watching the news, by watching your uh, Facebook or Instagram feeds, you know that we face a hope deficit in this world. You can feel it, you can hear it, and you can see it. You don't need me to elaborate, but if I didn't elaborate, there wouldn't be much of a sermon, so I'm going to elaborate. So here's one of the ways that this hope deficit shows up for us. When you look at, uh, at the greatest public uh, the greatest threats to public health for teenagers 30 years ago, there were things like uh, alcohol, drunk driving, teen pregnancy, and smoking. These topped the list of things that threatened the, the health uh, and well-being of teenagers 30 years ago. And it's fascinating that when you look at those same things today, the numbers on every one of them have gone down. There is less drinking, less drunk driving, less teen pregnancy, less smoking among teens. And that might lead you to think, if you didn't know what was happening in the world around you, to believe that, wow, gosh, the world is such a better place now. People are so much healthier now than they have ever been. But we know that's not right. All that we've done is exchanged vices for a device. You see what I did? See, I included a dad joke for two reasons. One, it's okay to laugh in church occasionally, not too much, but occasionally. And two, my daughter just loves my, my dad jokes so much. And so I threw it in there so that she could just really enjoy my sense of humor. Uh, her name is Charlotte, if you want to talk to her afterwards. Uh, we have exchanged vices for devices. 
devices that distract us from who God made us to be. And, and this is not generationally bound. I'll deal with that in a minute. But in the context of our teenage conversation, let's just finish this part of the conversation first. We've exchanged devices for, or we've exchanged vices for devices that distract us from our identity as children of God. They distract us and diminish our capacity to engage in relationships. They lower our eyes from the horizon to the screen in ways that make it hard for us or harder for us to believe in a future with hope. So if you want to know how that shows up in the public health crisis, crises that we face today as teenagers, what you'll find is not higher levels of the traditional vices. What you'll find instead is a 60% increase in depression in the last 15 years among teenage folks. You'll find a similar increase in suicide among teenage folks. There is less hopefulness. Despair is taking root for this generation in a way that is a little bit different, in a way that is profound. There is a hope deficit in our world today. And like I said a minute ago, or like I alluded to a minute ago, this is not a generationally bound issue. Let's not fall into the trap of thinking, well, that's a young person's problem. Because the opposite is true. This isn't a young person's problem. This is a human problem. Right? You can go look at the studies yourselves, but some of the studies say that or suggest that one out of five adults over the age of 60 struggle either with a mental health disorder or with substance abuse. Some studies say that number is more like two out of three. Right? Hopelessness and despair is not a young person's problem. That is not generationally bound to, gosh, kids these days. It is also not an old person's problem. It is a human problem that we face. And by the way, that's not just an out there problem, right? Whatever your bubble is. I don't know people talk about the Petrie City bubble. If that's your bubble or if your bubble is uh, somehow differently defined, it exists not just out there, but it exists in your bubble as well. I'll, I'll give you one example from some of the U.S. Census data. Uh, part of coming to a new community is I try to do some demographic work to understand the community that we're in a little bit better, and so I did so. Uh, one of the fascinating things that you can discover by looking at reports produced by U.S. Census data is that in 2017, in Peachtree City, uh, they rated the most important, let's see, some of the most important moral or social beliefs. Right, some of the strongest and most important moral and social beliefs. Number two on that list in 2017, so just five, six years ago, number two was, I have great hope for the future of my community. After just five years, in 2022, they re-ran that data and added to it, that number two strength of importance statement is now number 11. At a very data-driven level, Hope is diminishing in our culture. And that's not just, a, well, that's other people. That's other parts of the country. That's another part of the city. That's in Peachtree City. Hope is diminishing and there is a hope deficit. We are less and less able to imagine a hope with future. A ho or a future, <laughs> a hope with a future. A future with a hope. And yet the hope of the gospel stands ready and waiting to meet that challenge right now, if only, if only we would connect our neighbors, if we would connect our community to that kind of hope. The truth is our communities will be connected to the hope of the gospel, not because of a church program. Not that those will hurt, not that those are bad to do, but that's not the primary driver behind connecting our community with the hope of the gospel. And the sad truth is it's also not a preacher. Right? It's not a preacher that's going to connect our neighbors in our world to the hope of the gospel. The truth is God's chosen instrument, right? the chosen means of God for connecting the world to the hope of the gospel spoken to in the resurrection of Jesus Christ is you. You are the, the means by which God desires to connect your neighbors your family, your friends, your co-workers to, to the hope of the gospel that, that animates not just our lives, but animates the redemption and transformation of the entire world. You are the means that God has chosen to do that work. Now, here's what I don't mean by that. What I don't mean is don't go out and buy a bullhorn and stand on the street corner and yell at people about how angry you are about the world and how they're all going to hell. If that's you, I'm coming for you. I will hunt you down. If you are that guy, I'm coming for you. Now, 
There was a day and age when that was the best example of that, like yelling on the street with a bullhorn. But there's a better one now, right? It's Facebook. If you're the one who thinks we're going to connect the world to the hope of the gospel by ranting and raving about how progressives are ruining a great thing or how conservatives uh, are keeping us from a great thing, if you're the one ranting and raving about how the world is headed downhill, if you are the one ranting and raving about how the world deserves what it gets because they've just lost their minds, let me assure you of two things. One, I can see it too. I mean, I, I don't know. Like, is that, is that who we want to be? And two, it doesn't work. It, it doesn't work. It makes you more angry, and it makes them more angry. What I mean by you being the chosen instrument of God to connect the world to the hope of the gospel is that we follow the model that's laid out over and over again in Scripture. That we stop lobbing grenades at the world around us thinking, well, that will convince them that God loves them. And instead, that we might listen to the stories in Scripture over and over again that show us how to do this work. That, that give us a model for us to follow. And yes, they are ancient. But for the love of all that's holy, sometimes the best things are the old things, not the new. There is one of my favorite stories in all of the Bible that is the best example, I'm, like for me, that is the best example of this. And it's found in 2 Samuel chapter 9. And if, uh, if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to, uh, to, turn, uh, to turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 9. Uh, because it's a short chapter. It's a chapter that we overlook pretty often for two reasons. One is that it's so short that we just don't spend time on it. We're trying to get on to the good action. Uh, the second reason that we skip over it is there's a name in this chapter that's really hard for us to say, and because it's hard for us to pronounce, we tend to just skip it because it makes us feel less than smart sometimes. But it is such a beautiful story of what I think, about what I think it means for us to connect our neighbors with the hope of the gospel. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 9, which is two chapters after this story that I've alluded to again and again over the last six months, where, uh, where David has established Jerusalem as the center of the Jewish universe, where the presence of God resides in the capital of Israel from that day to this day. And David comes to God and says, I'm going to build you a house. God says, you're not going to build me a house. I'm going to build you a house in the sense of a dynasty. And God promises David that he's going to establish an everlasting covenant with one of David, or an everlasting kingdom on the shoulder of one of David's sons. And God very specifically says, and I will never remove my hesed, that's the Hebrew word for loving kindness or covenant faithfulness. I will never remove my hesed from you and from your descendants. So David, uh, first of all, a beautiful illustration. I'm going to get myself all off track, but a beautiful illustration of humility and the power of humility. David's response to that is, who am I? Who am I, God, that you would give this gift of the promise of an eternal kingdom and love to me? I love that kind of humility in conversation. Uh, and then uh, in the next chapter, in 2 Samuel chapter 8, what we see is that God establishes the borders of Israel. And remember, the borders of Israel, the land of Israel, the promised land, was the physical sign of God's salvation and redemption of Israel at that time. So when God establishes the borders, it's like God shoring up in a very visible way, you are my people. And it's funny, I wish we had a map. This is another example of, I, I thought of it too late, but I wish we had a map because we could go through 2 Samuel chapter 8 and we could see that God shores up the western border and then the eastern border and then the northern border and then the southern border all the way around Jerusalem. It's fascinating. They're just a bunch of random place names to us, but what God is doing is saying, you are my people. I have given you a home to live in. Now we get to 2 Samuel chapter 9, and what is it that we expect David to do? We might expect David, finally, uh, when it, with his kingdom secure, with this incredible promise from God, what we might expect David to do is to sit back and say, awesome, I am amazing, God is great, let's just wait and see what God does next while we take a beat and while we sit back. And that is exactly what David does not do. 
What he says in the very, very, very first verse of 2 Samuel chapter 9 is this. Is there anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I may show loving kindness? Let me explain what's going on. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, David made a covenant with his best friend. His best friend was named Jonathan. This is when David has been named the next king. He's kind of king-elect, but that's a complicated story. He's the king-elect, and he makes a covenant with his best friend Jonathan, and they say to each other, hey, I'm going to take care of your family. You're going to take care of my family. No matter what happens in the future, we're going to care for each other and for each other's families. Well, that got real because... Jonathan's father, Saul, was David's predecessor king. And Saul and David fought each other. Saul and David were at odds with each other. And eventually, Saul and his son, Jonathan, die. David becomes king. And now David is looking to fulfill that covenant. He says, is there anyone left of the house of Saul, of the house of Jonathan, of my best friend's family? Is there anyone left to whom I can show covenant faithfulness to whom I can show has said to. Isn't it fascinating that just as David has received this gift of love, this gift of covenant faithfulness from God, now he goes looking for somebody to reflect that love onto. He has received from God and now he's looking to give in the same way that God has given to him. Is there anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness is David's question. Nobody around there knows, and so they call a servant who used to serve King Saul, and his name is Ziba. And by the way, if you're pregnant, there are some amazing names in this chapter. Ziba is one of them. As Ziba comes and David says to him, is there anyone left of the house of Jonathan to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba says, there is somebody. There is somebody left, and he's a son of Jonathan, and he's crippled in his feet, and he lives in the, uh, the house of Machir, son of Amiel in Lodabar, and his name is Mephibosheth. Yeah, again, if you're pregnant, I got a deal for you, but don't, th- don't act too quickly. Wait till you hear what Mephibosheth means. So let's just, let's just get a sense of who this kid is. Right? David is asking, is there anyone that I can help? Ziba says, there is somebody left. But think about who he is. He is the son of a disgraced, the grandson of a disgraced king of Israel. He is crippled in his feet. When his father and grandfather were killed, his nurse was trying to get him away to safety, but she dropped him on his feet and something happened. We're not told exactly what happened, but he's unable to walk. He's crippled in his feet. And in that culture, not our culture, but in that culture, a physical uh, disability like that would have communicated God's displeasure. Okay, so you're the son or the grandson of a disgraced king. You used to be at the center of the universe but now you are a family who has been shunned. Now you actually have no family, and we can see that because your physical body is a sign that God has abandoned you. And not only that, you live in Machir, son of Amiel's house in Lodabar. Now, do you know where Lodabar is? You don't? Well, that is very surprising information. Or that's exactly what we expect. Archaeologists don't even know where Lodabar, are, where Lodabar is. If you look at a map, you'll find it in four different places. That means they took a dart and they threw it. You'll find it in four different places. Nobody knows where Lodabar is because it's so insignificant. It is so unimportant. It is so far away from the center of power that we don't even know where it is. That's how far away Mephibosheth is. We think maybe it's even on the other side of the Jordan River. It's about as far away from Jerusalem, the center of the universe, as you can get and still be in Israel. So let's just keep some score. Son of a disgraced king. Your body is a sign of God's displeasure. You live in a place that is less than nothing, that history will have forgotten in a few short years. And your name is Mephibosheth, which means one who scatters shame. If you want to know what hopelessness and despair looks like, look no further 
than Mephibosheth. Lost, forgotten, disgraced, broken. That's Mephibosheth. And that is who Ziba brings to David, the king of Israel, the anointed king, God's chosen king. That's who Ziba brings to David's attention in the opening verses of 2 Samuel chapter 9. And so David says to Ziba, bring him here. Bring him to my palace. Now, if you're Mephibosheth, lost, forgotten, broken, disgraced, if you're Mephibosheth and servants of the new king show up at your house in Lodabar, what do you think is about to happen? We know what happens to rivals to the throne. We know what happens to family members who could one day threaten the new king. We eliminate them. What do you think Mephibosheth expected when he is summoned to the new king's palace? He could only have expected death. But ultimately, friends, he's just been waiting for that for most of his life. He was lost and forgotten and broken and disgraced. If you want to know what hopelessness is, it's Mephibosheth. And let's be honest about two things, who's in the room and who's not in the room. There are some of you in this room who know Mephibosheth because you have lived his life. You have felt forgotten, or you have felt broken, or you have felt lost, or you have felt disgraced, or you have felt all of it. And so when God summons you, we expect only bad things. Because what could God want with us? What would God want with me? And let's be honest about who's not in the room. There are people in your life right now. You live perhaps in the same house as them. You might live next door to them. You might go to school with them. Or you might work with them. And they live in Lodabar. And they believe the lies that they are Mephibosheth. They believe God has forgotten them. They believe God desires their brokenness. They believe God wants them to remain lost. And they believe that God could only look upon them with disdain and disgrace. So what happens when Mephibosheth arrives in Jerusalem? It says in 2 Samuel chapter, let's see, chapter 9 in verse 6, that Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face. It says he did obeisance, which means that he falls down and bows down, prostrates his body in front of David because he knows he's about to die. But David said, Mephibosheth, he called his name, Mephibosheth. And he answered, I'm your servant. And David said to, said to Mephibosheth, do not be afraid, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I'll restore to you all the land of your grandfather, Saul, and you yourself shall eat at my table always. In one sentence, David restores his identity. David restores his provision. David restores his status. David restores his purpose in life. In one sentence, he calls out to Mephibosheth and says, you don't have anything to fear. You have a place at the king's table. And Mephibosheth does what you and I do every time. We don't believe it. That cannot be right. Not me. Mephibosheth says this. What is, he bows down again. He says, what is your servant that you should look upon a dead dog such as I? That's how Mephibosheth sees himself. He sees himself as a dead dog. He says, why would you do this for me? Fascinating, by the way, that Mephibosheth's response is the same as David's response to God. Who am I that you would do this for me? Friends, too many of us 
believe that we don't, that, that we're not deserving of life in the kingdom of God, that we're not deserving of a, of a seat at the king's table. Too many of us believe that despair and hopelessness has and always will define us. And yet, the work that David, through Ziba, does is to bring this lost and forgotten and broken and disgraced man home. Brothers and sisters, is that not exactly what it looks like to connect the world around us to the hope of the gospel? We're not David in this scenario, by the way. We're not the king. I think we're Ziba, right? We're the servant who the king has commissioned to go out and find the one in our life who needs to come home. We are the, we are the Ziba of this world who has been called and commissioned to go into the world looking not to throw grenades at our neighbor, not to, not to, not to be condescending towards them because they've messed it up, not to, not to throw, uh, spew venom at each other online, we've been commissioned to be Zeba to show up in Lodabar because everybody else has forgotten where it is, except for God. We are the chosen means that God, by which God desires to reach a world that is run through with despair. We've got a job to do, friends. As we think about this new year, as we think about your life as an individual, and perhaps even more importantly, our life as a, as a community and as a church, there is a world that surrounds us in desperate need to know the thrill of hope. And if we don't share it, who will? If we don't put our lives on the line to make the journey to Lodabar, then who will? And yes, you don't know enough of the Bible. And yes, you don't know all of the words that you need to say. And yes, it's frightening. And yes, it makes us uncomfortable. But this is the work that God made you for. This is the work that God is currently equipping you for. And this is what it looks like to transform the world. I'm making the trip to Lodabar and bringing Mephibosheth home.